Tonight on Bridge City News, Federal Health Minister Patty Hyde is still not certain when Canada will bring back Canadians stuck in China with the coronavirus. A drug bust in Lethbridge leads to the arrest of two and the recovery of not just meth and cocaine, but also stolen identity cards. And we hear how Samaritan's Purse is helping those in Australia with recovery and cleanup efforts as the wildfires continue. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Robbins. Good evening. Thanks so much for joining us. Federal Health Minister Patty Hyde says the World Health Organization's declaration of a global health emergency because of the coronavirus will not change the way Canada is handling the situation. She says the risk is currently low. Hyde is also not sure when Canada will repatriate more than 150 Canadians from Wuhan, China, where the virus originated. The risk remains low. Uh, obviously, uh, it is uh, low because partly uh, travel to and from the re affected region and from China is becoming more difficult. And of course, we have a very sophisticated system here in Canada, which has been noted, by the way, uh, by the World Health Organization as one that's extremely responsive and able to not only support people that may be uh, under investigation for having the, the virus, but who are ill. Of course, we're going to put into place measures to protect Canadians who are are in China, in the region, uh, regardless of their situation, and uh, that will be different for different needs. I mean, some people have not, uh, don't want to leave, but they need other kinds of supports and services, and so we'll work on a case-by-case -case basis with the Chinese government and with the Canadians that are in the region to support them in, in the best way possible. A couple from Toronto who arrived from China with the coronavirus and checked into hospital have apparently improved to the point where they're both at home now. A new case of the coronavirus, however, has been confirmed in London, Ontario. Meanwhile, a Vancouver man in his 40s is still in hospital in British Columbia. Worldwide, the death toll has surpassed 200 from the virus. An Edmonton MP asked Health Minister Patty Hyde for more details about the government's plan to bring home Canadians under quarantine in China while protecting those of us here at home. Mr. Speaker, the government has confirmed that they now have a plane which at some point is expected to bring Canadians in China back home. However, there is very little information being shared about the plan to get these individuals home. The minister has said that they will be quarantined, but her officials confirmed at yesterday's health committee meeting that they still don't know what that means. Can the minister tell Canadians what her quarantine plan is? Speaker, and I'd like to correct the record. I have said that all options are on the table to make sure that we're protecting the health and safety of Canadians here in Canada and those that are abroad. I can confirm that the 196 Canadians have registered for help to get back to Canada. I'm working closely with my partners at Global Affairs and the Public Health Agency, and we will be putting together a comprehensive plan that ensures the health and safety of all Canadians, regardless of where they're residing. I will say information that we are hearing preliminarily from China is that patients who are ill will not be able to travel back to Canada, which raises important questions about how we can best support them while they are still in the region of Hubei. Our parliamentary reporter Ray Filion says Canada may have a problem getting an airplane into the affected area in China. Uh, but we still have no idea how at this point uh, as to when those Canadians are going to be brought home. Uh, the Canadian government announced on Wednesday afternoon that they had chartered a plane, but the plane, last time we checked, was still here in Canada, unable to fly the plane into China because the Chinese government is not uh, letting planes, for non-commercial flights, land in the affected area. Ray will have more on what Canada is doing to repatriate Canadians from China coming up in the second half of our show. Americans returning from visiting family in China for the Lunar New Year holiday describe what it's like in the Asian nation right now and traveling during the ongoing coronavirus outbreak. Um, I think it's quite serious and people are concerned. Nobody uh, goes on the streets. Most of the people are staying at home. Yeah. And people just order grocery and meals uh, through delivery. There's no symptom for the first like one to two weeks. So that means you could carry virus without knowing that and, and you could be the carrier and spread it. So that's the, the serious part, yeah. And you don't know who around you is carrying virus because there's no symptom. Health officials in the United States have reported the first U.S. case of person-to-person -person spread of the new virus from China. The man in his 60s is married to a Chicago woman who got sick after she returned from a trip to Wuhan, the epicenter of the virus. 
Today, the CDC, the Illinois Department of Public Health, Cook County Department of Public Health, and the Chicago Department of Health are confirming the second case of novel coronavirus here in Illinois. The second case is a Chicago man and is the husband of the first confirmed case in Illinois. This second case did not travel to China, making this the first person-to-person -person transmission of the novel coronavirus in the United States. Public Safety Minister Bill Blair gave an update in the House of Commons today on how much money has been raised through the Canada Strong campaign. It's an initiative that provides help for the families of victims who died when the Ukrainian Airlines plane was shot down in Iraq earlier this month. In total, 176 people lost their lives, including 57 Canadians. Canadians across Canada continue to mourn the victims tragically killed in the plane crash in Iran. The Canada Strong campaign has crowdsourced more than half a million dollars to support the families. Our government will match donations to this fund up to one and a half million dollars. The funds will be used to support the families of the victims as they navigate through the long-term impacts of these tragic losses. Canada Strong and other fundraising efforts show how Canadians come together in solidarity to help their neighbours in time to need, and I would encourage all Canadians to consider offering their support. Two men are in custody following another drug bust in Lethbridge. Following a short-term investigation, Lethbridge police obtained a warrant and seized a swath load of drugs at a residence along the 300 block of 5th Street South. Police confiscated crack cocaine, methamphetamine, scales, and many stolen identity documents. 51-year-old Jeffrey Stephen Martins and 34-year-old Eric Joel Michaud, both of Lethbridge, face various charges. The union representing prison guards says it's against a needle exchange program starting at a prison in central Alberta. The Union of Canadian Correctional Officers says staff at the Bowdoin Institution near Red Deer will be at greater risk when the program starts there in March. It says a supervised injection site is a better option. A federal program introduced two years ago provides injection kits that eligible inmates can use in their cells. The province of Alberta is looking for more doctors to perform surgeries to reduce wait times. Alberta Health Services is looking at independent facilities to provide more publicly funded surgeries. It will be part of the Alberta Surgical Wait Times Initiative that will fund 80,000 more surgeries in hospitals and clinics over the next three years. Last year, Alberta provided around 40,000 publicly funded surgeries under contract with the EHS at no cost to patients. Currently, around 293,000 surgeries are completed in Alberta each and every year. Hospitals provide 260,000 of them, or around 85%. New vaping legislation goes into effect tomorrow in Saskatchewan. The province's health minister, Jim Ryder, says the new law will better protect youth from the risks associated with e-cigarettes. The legislation bans the sale of vaping devices and products to anyone under the age of 18. It will also restrict their use in and around public buildings. The new law will also prohibit retailers from displaying vaping products if young people are allowed inside of the business. A Lethbridge man who experienced a medical emergency at ATB Centre last year was reunited with a team of paramedics who saved his life. BCN's Lawrence Alexander was at the Lethbridge Fire Station earlier today to hear his story. Joking around with firefighters, Tony Days doesn't look like someone whose heart quit on him six weeks ago. On December 15th, whew, my world was changed forever. Um, I suffered a heart attack while playing hockey. Lethbridge Fire Department officials say the integrated response model of paramedic firefighters allowed for a seamless upturn and 52-year-old Days is one of their success stories. When we got on scene, that we were like led to the room by the people who were playing hockey with him at the time. Uh, we walked in and found him in the dressing room on the floor unresponsive, felt that he had no pulse and started CPR and began the entire cardiac arrest process from there. Days says his friends saw the warning signs and knew something was wrong. I was lucky. Not only did my friends know what was going on, but STARS was diverted. I think they were on their way to either Claire's home or Cardston. They were diverted to, to the hospital. So STARS was actually waiting for me instead of me having to wait for STARS. An emotional daze was overcome with gratitude for what the paramedic firefighters did for him. I'm standing here and I shouldn't be standing here. From all the doctors, from all the nurses, even from some of these guys, I should not be here right now. So the first time I came in to meet him, it was, man, it was, not that I get emotional often, but um, yeah, it was so emotional seeing these guys and knowing what they did for me 
and my family. I got three young kids. When I think through that event, I think about the chain of survival. And the chain of survival, the first thing is call 911 early. And, the, and that happened. The second thing is early bystander CPR, and that happened. And then the third thing is our, our crews need to arrive on time. And all those things happened. And, and that is really a big part of the reason. The dedication of many people was the is, is a big part of the reason why Tony is here today. This is the dressing room in which Dave suffered his heart attack on December 15th at approximately 9 p.m. He'd like to thank his friends and family, the staff here at ATV Center, and of course the Lethbridge Fire Department for coming to his rescue in such a timely manner. For Bridge City News, I'm Loris Alexander. Cancer, it is a word that strikes fear into many. We all know someone who has either died from the disease or is going through health challenges right now. Glynis Bellick battled ovarian cancer and she survived. She wrote a book about her ordeal and says the best way you can support someone going through cancer is to be there for them. A person who's dealing with cancer, their emotions are up and down. You're, it's kind of like a helter-skelter of emotions. And some days are fine and you know, I'm superwoman, I conquer the world. Other days you're like laying flat and you're crying your eyes out. And um, But yeah, it's really good to definitely pray. Be there just to listen sometimes, a hand on the shoulder, you know, yes, a, a meal or something that just shows that you care. Catch the amazing story that Glennis has to share about her cancer journey coming up at the second half of our show. The Alberta Firefighters Association says it is very concerned about a change to the building code which would allow wood frame structures up to 12 stories high. The group says it wants the province to provide specific training and have emergency response plans for municipalities that allow such buildings. It says wood frame buildings burn quicker and hotter than others. The association says the government did not consult with it and wants the change delayed until after review of the National Building Code later this year. Now that the U.S. and Mexico have ratified the new free trade deal known as the USMACA, or USMCA, it is up to Canada to do the same. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says the new deal will help all Canadians. He says he has received indications from other parties that will help his minority government pass legislation to approve the deal. In a minority parliament, the message is different political parties and MPs of different stripes need to work together to deliver for Canadians. And that's a lesson we can all take as Canadians. And a great example is on the new NAFTA. We've moved forward this week with securing our trade access to the United States. Securing it not just for a few more years, but for a few more generations. Having top Republicans and top Democrats agree and try to take credit for this great deal means that businesses, workers, investors in Canada and around the world can now be confident in the strength of that relationship. Calgary Conservative MP Michelle Rempel Garner blasted an expert panel report that recommends an overhaul of broadcasting and telecom rules in Canada. She says the panel wants to give the government control over news Canadians are allowed to see. Mr. Speaker, yesterday a government-appointed panel enthusiastically recommended that the government should control what news coverage Canadians should be allowed to see. Under this Liberal plan, the Liberals would be able to force all news sites to prominently link all of their coverage to Liberal government-approved websites. This would have an instant chill effect on free speech and diversity of thought in the Canadian media ecosystem. Does the government think that Canadians are too dumb to think for themselves? The Honourable Minister of Heritage. Speaker, there seems to be some confusion on the other side of the House between members of the Conservative Party. On the one hand, mere hours after the report was published, a member for Durham declared that he would throw it in the garbage. Well, that's the exact type of fake news that the Liberals want these news sites to implement. <laughs> yesterday, their chosen one print media bailout fund, and even the minister's mandate letter goes as far as to suggest that he should implement the thought police, the ministry of thought police <laughs> for Twitter and Facebook. Like, this is not free speech, and free speech should be something we should be standing up for. Across the pond, London's mayor, Sadiq Khan, says he's heartbroken about Britain's departure from the European Union. The UK took its historic step out of the EU at 11 o'clock London time today. 
Khan is reassuring European citizens living in the British capital they are valued friends and family members. He says he is proud that Londoners voted overwhelmingly in the 2016 Brexit referendum to remain in the EU. More than 30 people have died from the devastating wildfires in Australia. Reports say more than 2,200 homes have also been destroyed and more than 20 million acres of land has burned. As we hear in this next report, more volunteers from Samaritan's Purse disaster response teams have been arriving in some of the most ravaged regions to help with the cleanup and recovery efforts. It's all gone. You can never replace it. And it's like a movie, a horror movie, eh? Like you normally see on TV. Samaritan's Purse is in Batemans Bay, Australia. Bushfires have been burning all across Australia for the last several months. Millions of acres have been burned, thousands of homes have been destroyed, and lives have been lost. Samaritan's Purse has volunteers that are helping disaster-affected communities and families to recover and just offer some degree of hope. We'll help them with sifting through debris to try to find any kind of lost items. We'll also help with yard cleanup, cutting trees, as we continue to work here in Australia, uh, we would just ask for your prayers as we try to love homeowners and help them recover. We just want to thank you for your support as we continue to help the people of Australia. It was on this day that a Libyan intelligence officer was convicted of the Pan Am 103 bombing. The U.S. launches its first satellite into orbit, and Austrian composer Franz Schubert is born. This is Today in History for January 31st. <laughs> January 31st, 1958, America enters the space age, successfully launching its first satellite into orbit, Explorer 1. It happens just months after the Soviet Union launches Sputnik, the very first satellite into orbit. 2001, a Libyan intelligence officer is convicted of murder and gets life in prison for the bombing of Pan Am Flight 103 in Lockerbie, Scotland. That's the verdict from a Scottish court convened in the Netherlands. The court acquits a second Libyan in the 1988 bombing, which killed 270 people. 1945. Private Eddie Slovic becomes the first U.S. soldier since the Civil War to be executed for desertion. Slovic is shot by an American firing squad in France during the final months of World War II in Europe. 1923. Norman Mailer, one of the great American authors in the years after World War II, is born in Long Branch, New Jersey. And 1797. Composer Franz Schubert is born in Vienna, Austria. Today in History, January 31st. Mike Gracia, The Associated Press. There's some great new movies playing at the mill this weekend, including Spies in Disguise. With more, here's the BCN Movie Mill Minute. Spies in Disguise. Super spy Lance and scientist Walter are almost exact opposites. But when events take an unexpected turn, Walter and Lance suddenly have to rely on each other in a whole new way. And if this odd couple can't learn to work as a team, the whole world is in peril. There's a bad guy who needs to be stopped. And now I have to try to stop him while being a bird. Lucky for you, I'm your wingman. This is official business. Parasite. All unemployed, Keytech and his family take a peculiar interest in the wealthy and glamorous parks as they integrate themselves into their lives and get entangled in an unexpected incident. We had a wind warning earlier today, strong Chinook winds, but also warmer temperatures. It may be a good weekend to finally hit the slopes with the milder temps. A full look at the weather forecast is coming up, along with the BCN Ski Report. Environment Canada issued a wind warning earlier today, strong Chinook winds. The winds, however, have also brought us warmer temperatures, Jeanette. Yeah, 
that's right. And what a beautiful day it was today. I, I dare say that it was the hot spot in Canada. So you know what? I looked it up and you know what it was? Claire's home was the hot spot in Canada today, but I would say Lethbridge being a close second. 12 degrees high, but I think we reached 13. Up to 14 degrees is expected for tomorrow. We do have a chance of showers as well. But also beware that with warm weather comes when we have a wind warning in effect for this evening. 100 kilometer per hour winds. And it could be gusting up to 120 even. So be careful with that. It could be damaging. Sunday, we have a 20% chance of flurries, a high of one degree. And then we're going to drop into minus seven on Monday. Lots of sunshine, though, for the rest of the week there with some scattered clouds. One is the high on Tuesday, and then we're going to climb all the way back up to the double digits there Wednesday for 11 um, and eight degrees is expected on Thursday. The almanac highs and lows Minus one being the high temperature average and minus 13 being the low temperature average. We are definitely seeing higher temperatures than that. The highest temperature on this day was recorded in 1962. It was 14 degrees and the lowest temperature was back in 1969. It was minus 39. The sun rose this morning at 8.06 a.m. and it set this evening at 5.23 p.m. So let's take a look at what's happening across the country tomorrow for the highs. Uh, the West Coast still going to be seeing some showers there, highs of 9 degrees in Victoria, 6 degrees is the high expected tomorrow for Vancouver, 9 degrees in Calgary, and 6 degrees up in Edmonton. We are expecting some showers as well there. Sunshine up in Saskatoon with a high of 6 degrees, 9 degrees expected in Regina, and Winnipeg still snowing. They're expected uh, to see a high of 1 degree tomorrow. Over in Toronto, this whole region is going to see some flurries as well. One degrees is expected in Toronto, minus two in Ottawa, and over in Montreal, minus five is the high with a mix of sun and cloud. And then moving over further east into Atlantic Canada, Fredericton's high, one degree. Same thing for Halifax. Halifax should see some snow though. Same thing for Charlottetown. Minus three is their high. Minus eight is expected in St. John's. And finally, they're getting a reprieve from their snow, which they've seen all week. A mix of sun and cloud over there in St. John's. There you go, that is your forecast. Take it away with the ski report. Marmot Basin has had three centimeters of new snow with a 110 centimeter base. No new snow at Castle Mountain, but there's still a 196 centimeter base. Sunshine Village has had five centimeters of fresh snow and a 140 centimeter base. Lake Louise has had three centimeters of new snow and a 138 centimeter base. Mount Norquay has had one centimeter of fresh powder and an 81 centimeter base. McKiska has had three centimeters of fresh snow and a 107 centimeter base. No new snow in Whistler, but they still have a 253 centimeter base. Panorama has had two centimeters of fresh powder and a 105 centimeter base. Whitefish, Montana, no new snow, but a 290 centimeter base. Be safe and have fun on the slopes this weekend. Deputy Prime Minister Christian Freeland is urging the opposition parties to get on with enshrining the revamped North American Free Trade Pact into law. Freeland says Canada needs to join the U.S. and Mexico by ratifying the deal. She says the new NAFTA preserves the core of the existing deal while improving parts of it that affect various Canadian industries. The U.S. and Mexico have already ratified the agreement. The Canadian Implementation Bill has been introduced in the House of Commons with only the Bloc Québécois voting against the motion to make way for legislation. The federal government ran a deficit of $11.8 billion just past the midway point of the 2019-2020 fiscal year. That compares with a deficit of just $2.1 billion in the same period of the previous year. The Finance Department says program expenses have climbed nearly $15 billion. Meantime, revenues were up $5.7 billion over the previous year due to growth in personal income tax revenues. Imperial Oil says its fourth quarter profit was down 68% from a year ago to $271 million. Revenue and other income increased to $8.16 billion from $7.89 billion in the same quarter a year earlier. Imperial says profit at its upstream operations amounted to $96 million compared to a loss of $310 million in the final quarter of 2018. Net earnings from downstream operations dropped to $225 million from $1.14 billion a year earlier. Company officials say it was due to lower margins and planned turnaround activities. A sweetened offer to take Hudson's Bay Company private has won the support of the Retailers Board of Directors. They're unanimously recommending shareholders accept the deal in a vote set for February 27th. A special committee of the board earlier endorsed the offer from a shareholder group headed by HBC Executive Chairman Richard Baker. 
It raised its going private offer to $11 per share from an earlier offer of $10.30 amid opposition by rival shareholder Catalyst Capital Group. As of today, Sobeys will officially be the first national grocery chain to remove plastic bags at all stores across the country. 250 stores across our nation are eliminating plastic bags from our stores permanently. Um, we've been told from the statistics that if you lined up all those bags, they would make a trip around the world almost three times. So that is a pretty big step on our part to eliminate such a large amount of waste, basically. Plastic is completely gone now. We have a variety of different options to choose from. Our large reusable bags for 99 cents. We're also offering paper bags for 10 cents and half of the proceeds go to One Tree Planted. And then we have t-shirt bags for 25 cents as well. Following this ecological move, the company will quickly follow with phasing out plastic grocery bags under all of its various brands, including Safeway, Freshco, and Foodland. Now, here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was down 172 points today to 17,318. The Dow was down more than 600 points on the day to 28,256. The S&P 500 was down 58 points to 3225, and the Nasdaq was down almost 148 points to 9150. Oil was down 51 cents of the day to 5163 per barrel. Natural gas was up a cent to a buck 84. Gold was up 1487 to 158916 per ounce, and silver was up 20 cents to 1804 an ounce. Wheat is at $232 per metric ton, barley's at $236, canola's at $442, and corn is at $274 per metric ton. Live cattle were down 40 cents to $122.65, feeder cattle were up 43 cents to $137.78, lean hogs were down $418 to $60.50, and the Canadian dollar was down slightly on the day to $75.54 US. Recapping one of our top stories this hour, Federal Health Minister Patty Hyde says the World Health Organization's declaration of a global health emergency because of the coronavirus will not change the way Canada is handling the situation. Hyde was also not sure when Canada will repatriate more than 150 Canadians from Wuhan, China. Our parliamentary reporter Ray Fillion says it may be quite difficult for Canada to land a plane in Wuhan where the coronavirus originated. He will explain why next. But first, here's a look what's happening in and around your community. Here's your Bridge City News community calendar. Night to Shine is an event sponsored by the Tim Tebow Foundation and hosted by My Victory Lethbridge on Friday, February 7th. Night to Shine is an unforgettable prom night experience for people with special needs ages 14 and older. This complimentary event begins on a red carpet with guests receiving the royal treatment, including hair and makeup stations, limousine rides, a catered dinner, and much more. For details and to register, visit myvictory.ca. And if you'd like to volunteer, email carol at myvictory.ca. Celebrate Family Day at the Galt Museum and Archives for their second annual free pancake brunch. Taking place on February 17th beginning at 10 a.m., come and enjoy delicious pancakes, music, crafts, and games. And while you're there, check out the exhibits and complete a special treasure hunt. Admission is free. For more information, visit galtmuseum.com events. The Lethbridge Association of the Blind provides numerous activities for the blind and visually impaired in the Lethbridge area. These events include dinners with entertainment, theatrical performances, local museum tours, bowling, and much more. For more information or to volunteer, call 403-942-1677 or email brownwj at shaw.ca. And that's your Bridge City News Community Calendar. The United States has ratified it, and so has Mexico. Now it's Canada's turn to sign onto the new NAFTA agreement, otherwise known as USMACA, USMCA. To talk more about it is our parliamentary reporter, Ray Fillion, joining me once again from Ottawa. Ray, Canadian Parliament has begun debating the ratification. Will the deal be signed soon? Well, the Americans uh, seem to think so. Uh, an American, a, a, a Trump a White House official this week saying that it's probably going to take the Canadian Parliament not more than two weeks to ratify the bill. I think that's a little optimistic. But yeah, the debate on, is now officially underway here in the nation's capital. First, uh, the House of Commons needs uh, to pass the bill, and then it's going to be up to the Senate to study the bill and ultimately uh, pass it, hopefully. Uh, every single party appears to be on board. Uh, the only party that voted against the motion to start the debate this week was the Bloc Québécois, and that's because 
They fear that the aluminum sector, which is mostly based in Quebec, is going to be penalized by this deal. You have to understand that uh, the aluminum sector in Canada does not enjoy, under the terms negotiated with the Americans and the Mexicans, does not enjoy the same level of protection as the steel uh, sector uh, does. Uh, so that's a problem for the bloc. Uh, they're, they're not, I, I don't think that the bloc will defeat the bill. They can't on their own anyway. But I, I, I think that what they're looking for is some sort of compromise on the part of the federal government. They want some sort of side deal, perhaps uh, see the federal uh, government uh, give them some sort of com compensation to the aluminum industry and the unions. That's what they're demanding. Uh, but I think it's it, it's it's a fact that it's going to be adopted at some point by the Canadian Parliament. When you look at the situation, even the aluminum industry uh, is calling on parliamentarians of all stripes uh, to pass the bill. They say it's it's in the interest of Canadians and Canada in general to have that new deal in place, just like uh, mayors and premiers. So I think it's just a question of time before it passes the Canadian uh, Parliament and it comes into force. It appears as though the Tory leadership race is now a two-horse race between Peter McKay and Aaron O'Toole. What happened to Marilyn Gladue? Well, Marilyn Gladue is still in the race, but she's not a, uh, a very big name. Uh, the two biggest names in the, in the race right now are uh, Peter McKay. Uh, he's undoubtedly the front runner right now. He's got the best organization. He's got a lot of support already from uh, Tory caucus members. Uh, something like almost 20 MPs, if I'm not mistaken, have said publicly in the last couple of weeks that they're going to be supporting uh, Mr. McKay. So he's the, the clear front runner here. His main challenger, as you said, is Ontario MP Aaron O'Toole, who, interestingly enough, went to Alberta on um, Tuesday to launch his campaign. And according to some Tories, what we have here is basically a battle between uh, the, the red Tories represented by Mr. McKay and the blue Tories represented uh, by Mr. O'Toole. So that's how the battle for now is shaping up. As you mentioned, there are other candidates like Ontario MP, uh, first term Ontario MP Derek Sloan in the race. Uh, John Williamson, a member of parliament from uh, New Brunswick, who also happens to be a former uh, prime minister, one of Stephen Harper's former um, uh, communications director, uh, thinking about joining the race, Marilyn Gladue, uh, as we said, an Ontario MP, but they're not very big names. The, the two biggest names in the race right now are Peter McKay and Aaron O'Toole. And Peter McKay accidentally ignited a debate on whether the next Tory leader should be bilingual. Ray, I'm thinking if you want any votes in Quebec, you better be bilingual. Well, absolutely. That's what most uh, Tories are thinking. But the situation is when Mr. McKay launched his campaign last Saturday in his native province of Nova Scotia, he delivered eight lines. There were eight lines in his speech that were in French. He did a good job with most of them, but he mangled uh, his French. Uh, wasn't good enough. Uh, it was very easy to understand what he meant in, in at least two of his uh, eight lines. So he was taken to task. I know a newspaper, a major daily in Quebec, uh, had this big title across its front page the next day on Sunday morning, Good Luck, Mister. And some Tory MPs, some Francophones from Quebec acknowledged that Mr. McKay should have done a better job. His French wasn't good enough during that speech, but they're saying, hey, be patient. Uh, the leadership is still, uh, the, the race is just getting underway. Mr. McKay will improve, they say. That remains to be seen. I thought it was quite interesting uh, this week, uh, a Tory MP from Alberta, Shannon Stubbs, uh, she publicly said in a scrum with reporters that bilingualism shouldn't be a, a criteria. That, and she even went as far as to say that she wouldn't have a problem with a leader who doesn't speak English, as long as his or her positions align with hers. Uh, what? You're in Alberta, Al. I'm not sure it would no. sit well with most people there uh, if, uh, if a, a, a major party leader uh, couldn't speak English. Ray, I'm thinking you need to know both official languages, especially if you're a federal party leader. Even though he was shut out of the last federal election, Maxime Bernier, who knows English and French quite well, says the People's Party of Canada is not dead, but Ray, it must be on life support. Yeah, it looks that way because, as you'll recall, last October, they didn't manage to elect a, a single uh, MP from the PPC, the People's Party of Canada, uh, Maxime Bernier, a former Tory who quit uh, the Conservatives uh, in a huff uh, some 18 months ago to, to create his own party. You're right. He said that uh, in spite of the setback that his uh, party suffered in the last federal election, his party will be 
uh, a contestant in the next one. He even says that uh, fundraising has resumed. He's got half the candidates who ran last fall. They're willing to run again. And Mr. Bernier uh, said this week that he intends to run in the next by-election, no matter where it's going to be, uh, be it in his former riding of uh, the both south of Quebec City or even Alberta. He's willing to, to, to go there and run uh, in, in a riding if one becomes available uh, following a resignation or whatnot. Uh, the PPC received 1.6% of the votes in the last election. Mr. Bernier said it took the Green Party of Canada some 20 years to reach that level. So he seems to, to think that his party is still in, in a relatively good position right now. It remains to be seen if it's going to be a force to be reckoned with. Obviously, uh, at the time of the next election, it's going to be uh, a lot harder for Mr. Bernier to have his voice heard because none of his candidates were elected. He wasn't elected himself. So he's probably not going to be uh, invited to take part in any of the televised debates. Okay, Ray, let's talk about the coronavirus now. The World Health Organization is calling it a global health emergency. The latest numbers of the coronavirus is that more than 7,700 people have been infected, uh, more than over 100 people dead. I think it's around 170 now. So far, we have three confirmed cases here in Canada, one in Vancouver, two in Toronto. Ray, the government is repatriating Canadians from China. Are there not concerns that some of these passengers coming back will bring the virus back with them? Yeah, that's one of the concerns, which is why if and when they do bring those Canadians back in there, we're, we were told on Thursday that 196 Canadian national had expressed interest uh, in, in returning to Canada ASAP. Uh, the government says measures are probably going to be in place to put some of these people in isolation if they're showing symptoms. Uh, others might be quarantined. It's going to be uh, likely a case by case affair. Uh, but we still have no idea how, at this point, uh, as to when those Canadians are going to be brought home. Uh, the Canadian government announced on Wednesday afternoon that they had chartered a plane, but the plane, last time we checked, was still here in Canada, unable to fly the plane into China because the Chinese government is not uh, letting planes, for non-commercial flights, land in the affected area, the, you know, the province uh, where the city of uh, Wuhan uh, is. Uh, so right now, the Canadian officials are negotiating with Chinese authorities, trying to get a deal to get that plane to China and bring uh, these 196 Canadians home. And we have no idea when that's going to be. Well, Ottawa is still looking at the issue, Ray. One of Canada's allies has decided to allow Huawei to play a limited role in its 5G network. That's the United Kingdom. That's right. Very interesting story this week. Britain deciding to give uh, Huawei, to allow Huawei to play a limited role in their upcoming 5G network uh, for telecommunications. Uh, they're not going to be able to do everything. As I said, it's going to be a very limited role. Uh, Huawei, a, a Chinese company which is said to be very close to, to, to the regime in Beijing, won't be able, for example, to have any installations within uh, or anywhere near Britain's uh, nuclear plants. Now, the question is, as you said, Canada has been debating for a while now as to whether or not it should allow Huawei to play any sort of role in its up upcoming 5G network. Uh, is the British path one that Canada could follow? Uh, we asked the public safety minister, Bill Blair. We asked Navdeep Baines, the industry minister, this week. Uh, they wouldn't say anything. They said that Canada is still deliberating uh, the issue. Uh, this is a very hard uh, case for Canada, obviously, because on one side you have the Americans who are putting a lot of pressure on their allies, including Canada, not to let Huawei play any role. And on the other side, you have a major, another very important trading partner of Canada, China, which is pushing for Huawei to be allowed uh, to play some sort of role. So it, it looks to me like Canada is trying to delay uh, making a decision uh, in, in, in this case, I, I, I remember that last year, last spring, uh, the, uh, the then uh, public safety minister, Ralph Goodale, said that a decision would be made before the, ne the, uh, the next election, last October. That election came and went, and no decision has been made at this point. So they're delaying it. Ray, the big tech frontier project here in Alberta is now becoming a big issue in Ottawa. Absolutely, because of uh, the pollution it would uh, generate. And uh, a lot of people in the nation's capital are starting to debate it. Political parties have uh, started to take notice because uh, the Trudeau government is set to make a, a decision as to whether or not it'll give the green light to that major project in northern Alberta. It's a project that covers 240 
square kilometers, it would produce 260,000 oil barrels per day for 40 years. So a lot of people are saying it doesn't make any sense for a government that calls itself green, the Trudeau Liberals, a government that promised in the last election uh, to make Canada a carbon neutral country by 2050 to approve such a project. So it's going to be very interesting to see what kind of decision. Uh, we're talking about Huawei. We're talking about this project. A lot of very hard, uh, tough files for the federal uh, government on Justin Trudeau's desk right now. And this is just one of them. There have been lots of questions directed at the public safety minister after a man on parole killed a young woman in Quebec. Tell me more about that. Yeah, this is a very terrible story out of Quebec City. A man, a uh, convicted murderer, Hal, was uh, set free momentarily by a parole officer uh, a few weeks ago, uh, apparently because they thought it would be a good idea for that man uh, to satisfy his uh, sexual desires. So he met with a, social, with a uh, sex worker. Um, the, uh, the young woman, 22 years of age, was uh, found dead. And now the convicted murderer is facing a murder charge in connection with her death. So that sparked a lot of questions here in the nation's capital. The opposition conservatives demanding uh, some answers as to why this man was set free uh, for that kind of a reason. Uh, the public safety minister responded saying uh, the Corrections Canada and the parole board have launched a joint investigation. But yeah, there, there are also a lot of questions being asked as to whether or not parole officers in this country have uh, the skills and the proper training uh, to decide whether or not uh, some of these people should be set free. Our parliamentary reporter, Ray Filian, joining me once again from our nation's capital in Ottawa. Thanks so much, Ray. You bet. Cancer, just the word itself, can strike fear into our hearts. Most of us either know someone who has been impacted by cancer or we experienced it ourselves. Today's guest knows all about the pain, suffering and challenges surrounding the disease. Glynis Bellick joins me now from Drayton, Ontario. Glynis is author of the book Cancer. It's no laughing matter, but it helps. Glynis, thanks for joining me today on BCN. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me and for being interested in my book. You bet. Now, Glynis, this is a book about your personal journey and your battle with cancer. Why did you decide to write it? Well, to tell you the truth, it took me 10 years to, as I say in the introduction of my book, to get the guts to write this book. Um, basically, though, I had the idea, I really feel that, I know it sounds a little cliche, but God woke me up one night after a particularly rough time of chemo. I was, uh, I think it was my second or third session, and I was having a tough time and feeling, you know, all the side effects and lost my hair and lost my dignity, lost everything, and I was just feeling rough. So anyway, it was just kind of like I was woken up in the middle of the night and given this thought that cancer is, is really serious stuff, but you know what, it, it's okay to laugh and find joy and and have hope. And, and so this title kind of came to me, Cancer, No Laughing Matter, but it helps. So I looked over at my husband to see if he was awake and hearing anything, but it was just something that I was kind of hearing in my heart. And I wrote it down. And so, but I had no no desire to write a book about myself at that point. I was journaling and I'm so glad I journaled and I kept those journals. I I ended up writing a children's story called um, Mrs. B Has Cancer because I was teaching at the time and I was, um, th they had so many questions. And uh, so it was just kind of in response to that. But as far as writing my own book, I wasn't ready for that yet. So it did take me 10 years to uh, get around to it. So. so how did you respond when the doctor first told you it was ovarian cancer? Yeah. Good question. Uh, probably two words come to mind, flabbergasted and gobsmacked, to name a few. Um, it was, it, last thing I thought would happen to me, I, was, I, I, did, I wasn't in any pain. That was a funny thing. I was, it was just, I, looking back now, I had symptoms of ovarian cancer because they're very vague and they're very sort of middle of, you know, a, a woman's midlife and kind of all those funny symptoms. But I had lost a lot of weight. I was caring for my mom and uh, I was kind of running back and forth and up and down stairs and what have you. And I felt something in my abdomen. And so that took me to the doctor. But I never took my husband to the doctor when I was going to get figure out, you know, what had happened, um, because I just thought it was, like I said, some my uterus doing a flip flop or something. But I saw so I was rather speechless, which is hard for me. <laughs> but so I had to go back. So did you go through the surgery and then maybe radiation and chemotherapy? 
Yes, I didn't go through radiation, but I had emergency surgery like within a couple of weeks and then um, and then through chemo. Yeah, that was tough. Life changing stuff. Life changing stuff. Does open your eyes. So how long have you been cancer free? Ten years. Well, I, 10 years was my celebration to write the book. So 11 years now because the book took me, you know, between editing and everything else. It was a year coming out. But uh, yeah, so yay. Yes, thank you for that. Any advice <laughs> on you. how to deal with the fears that come up? that you can maybe give to our viewers who are battling cancer? It's really hard because everybody's situation is different, but probably, you know, where there's life, there's hope. And um, it, it makes you, it, it's cliche again, but it does make you stronger or, or you can wallow in self-pity and go the other way. But, you know, always hope, never give up. Um, fight the good fight and all those wonderful things and pray, 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 pray. It's okay to wallow for a while. Just don't stay there. You know, and uh, and this it's it's amazing what you can learn through your journey. And I was bound and determined that that was what I was going to do, and I did. I had a cousin who had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and he told he was telling me as he was going through his chemotherapy treatments, everything would taste metallic, mm. and, and then he lost yes. his hair as well. Did any of that happen with you? Uh, yeah, not so much the metallic. They, I, I, my appetite was incredible because I was on steroids. It's like, oh my goodness. So I, I ate a lot, and I, uh, but the doctors liked that, even though I didn't, because I was gaining a bit of weight at the process. But yeah, everything is different. Like your body metabolism is out of whack. Sometimes you're sick. Sometimes you're not. Sometimes you're, and there's really something. I don't know if you've heard of this, but chemo brain. That's a true thing that happens, and it means that, uh, and it affects again people differently but basically it's like things don't always you know turn out the way you want them to be sometimes I would find something in the fridge I thought I don't remember putting there something that shouldn't have been in the fridge or whatever but but you know just silly forgetful things and uh, you know and, and it's true your, your brain gets a little mangled and yeah now you say we have two choices each morning Glennis what are they you can wallow in that self-pity or you can put on your big girl's stretchy pants and get going and say, okay, God, what's what's in it for me today? And I had to do that for, for a while. And it's okay to wallow for a while. You're allowed to do that. You've ha had this horrific diagnosis and, and you don't know. And I didn't know at that point whether I was going to live or die or whether everything was going to be successful. But, you know, we it's, it's attitude. We can't control much. And that was what I really found out because I... I don't know if you can tell or not, but I have a bit of controlling personality. And I, I found out that I couldn't control much except my attitude. So I determined that I, I had to do that. And I had some wonderful friends, a, a girlfriend in, in Florida, actually. She, we went to school together and she was my, my rock and a lot of other people. And so, yeah. Let's talk about that. How important is it to have that strong support system? Yeah, very much so, very much so. And But it, also a word of advice too, you have to be able to accept that too. And that was where I struggled a little bit. Sometimes I was like this naughty child having a, a temper tantrum inside because like I can do it myself, but I really couldn't do it myself. I, I People wanted to bring me meals or do my gardening or help me with this, that and the other. And I, I was, I, I didn't want to let them do it, but God convicted me one day because I was kind of going through this and I never said this out loud it was just kind of to myself but he said Glynis you know what I'm going to tell you I give people gifts of hospitality or compassion and if you don't allow them to use them you're you're denying me and oh busted or what you know it was it was really an eye-opening for me I, it's not that I ever arrived and I'm now perfect at that because I still struggle with that but every time I think about that. It, it really makes me think twice that, yeah, God has given other people gifts to use for times like this. So had to suck it up. I remember when my father was battling, uh, he had a huge tumor in his esophagus. He couldn't swallow food anymore and he starved to death when my father passed away. And I remember, you know, as an only child being there for my father and he says, the most important thing you can do for me, son, is like to be a sounding board so he can oh. unburden himself and share and just to be there to love and support him as much as I can and to pray for him, obviously. What advice would you give to someone who has a relative going through that journey? I think that's absolutely good advice to be that sounding board because a, a person who's dealing with cancer, their emotions are up and down. You're, it's kind of like a helter-skelter of emotions and some days are fine and you know, I'm superwoman, I conquer the world. Other days you're like laying flat and you're crying your eyes out. And um, But yeah, it's really good to definitely pray. Be there just to listen sometimes, uh, hand on the shoulder, 
you know, yes, a, a meal or something that just shows that you care, that you're real, you're a person and that you have needs and, and you have all these emotions. And also, I'd like to also interject here, too, about the caregiver, because the caregiver is really important, too. And I'm sure you... Uh, know about that too caring for your father um, that is tough and and because you feel helpless don't you you know you want to fix it you want to help but really there's nothing you can do too so I think it's important that people don't forget about that caregiver our family also experienced a miracle uh, my father was diagnosed and two weeks before he died I remember on my birthday on June 11th I was praying because he couldn't swallow food anymore he was just drinking liquid morphine water and I said to him, let's take you out to a restaurant, Dad, for my birthday. He said, son, I can't eat any solid foods. I said, trust me. And I prayed to our Heavenly Father, please allow my dad's esophagus to open up. That day, Glennis, he had a steak, uh -huh. potatoes, salad. He had tears down, running, rolling down his cheeks. I don't know how this is possible. How is this possible? And I said, I know how it's possible, Dad. And then he died That's two right. weeks later. That's amazing. We're serving an amazing God. Isn't it something? It was a miracle that day on my birthday. Now, in the title of your book, you talk about laughter being a big help. How is that so? And when I, when I did that, I didn't want it to be disrespectful. And this is not a book filled with humor and laughter and making light of cancer. What it is, it, it's, it's how I coped. And just different things, because you have to have a sense of humor. You have to, because there's just plain things that you have to laugh at. For instance, let me think of one now. Um, when I was going for my bone scan, um, the, the clinician or the technician told me not to move and I must have because he said I had two heads so then we did the two heads are better than one yeah. and then he said he, he saw a shadow and I said maybe it's my brain he says nope there's no brain there at all so you know we kind of laugh at the we had to have to laugh at those small things and and when people come you know it's it's you don't have to be serious all the time yes you do want to talk a little bit about your cancer and your situation but tell me funny things, tell me about your children and I'll tell you about my children or grandchildren or whatever and, and it's, it's good. It kind of helps you through those tough times. You're right that God can actually turn evil into something good. What kind of good things could possibly come out of a battle with cancer? Right, I know it's, it's really hard. I will never say I'm glad I had cancer, but I'm grateful because man oh man, he brought a lot of people into my path that would never have been there before. and. My favorite scripture verse was and is Psalm 46, verse 10, be still and know that I am God. And I always loved that. And I had it on my business cards. And I, when I saw it, I thought, oh, yes, great verse. I didn't know what that meant until I was hit by this two by four of cancer and realized what being still meant, you know, and and uh, just the, the good things that he brought into my life and uh, made me slow down and, and appreciate things and know that. I am not in control, and uh, he's got this. No matter what, if I was going to die, no, I didn't want to die, um, but he had it if it was. In my book, I also have stories uh, in the last two chapters, I should say, from other people, friends and acquaintances, to tell their stories too, because I really wanted to share them. And my last chapter is actually dedicated to a friend, a writer friend of mine, who was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer, and she ended up dying before the book was published but she wanted to me to tell her story because she wanted to write it but of course she couldn't so I, I did a little bit I honored her as much as I could but I tell you that phone call that hour-long phone call to New Brunswick where she lived eye-opening she like she was ministering to me here I was you know I was fine she was dying from cancer and she was giving me all these beautiful stories and she told me and I, and I actually just wrote something about this today watching for the small miracles because we take so much for granted don't we you know and our day even every breath we take or you know just the different things that our, our hydro our technology you know all these things you know and um, she said look out for the small miracles and I tried to do that. I thought that was really good advice. And count your blessings each and every day. You know, I appreciate the smell of a rose, the hug of your child, a beautiful sunrise or a sunset, the taste of food, you know, just all of that. But does cancer often also help you to think about eternity? Yes, it does. It does. I thought a lot about death. And, um, and I find myself watching videos, too, and, and, and thinking and, um, about it. But I wasn't, it was funny, I wasn't, um, I, I, I was, I didn't want to die. I mean, I was just turning 52 and my daughter was ju just had her baby. I got to be with her two days before my surgery and I was in the delivery room and, uh, you know, I, I didn't want to die. But 
I was also getting to the point, I kind of crossed over at one point where, okay, if I'm going to die, it, that's your will, Lord. I remember being, when I was going in for chemo different times, I would see these young moms or these young fellows that come in uh, and, and, you know, they had children, small children. And here I am, a grandma. No, I didn't want to die, but I had lived a life, you know, a good life. And I had lots to be grateful for. But, you know, I just sometimes don't understand. One day I will. When we cross over, I'm sure we'll have all the answers. But <laughs> not right now. We just pray and give thanks. And like you said, count blessings. Yeah, God is not finished with either of us yet here. So what is the takeaway you want readers to remember from your book, Glennis? <clears throat> Probably the biggest takeaway is hope. To, I, I, in the back of my book, I've got a whole list of things that what I learned through cancer. And I think um, the thread of them is, is her, oh, hope. Um, you know, God is perfectly in control, I say here. I learned that God is perfectly in control. And when I doubt that for even a moment, he sends an angel to remind me. And those angels come in different forms, whether it be people, whether it be a blessing that comes through nature or whatever. But yeah, so yes, the, the takeaway I would like people to always hope. Hope is great. We need hope, definitely. Never give up. Faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. These is love. Amen. I wrote that today, too. <laughs> <laughs> Glennis Bellick, author of Cancer, It's No Laughing Matter, But It Helps. Thanks so much for joining me today from Drayton, Ontario. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Hal. Nice talking to you. <laughs> you as well. On behalf of all of us here at BCN, I'm Hal Roberts. God bless, and thanks so much for watching.